So, when we're looking for the main idea for the article, sometimes we can find an actual thesis, a sentence that we can underline. In this particular article, there is not one. So what we have to do is we have to take all the information and assimilate it and come up with the main idea. Now the generalized main idea that I found is this, how business markets and sells goods or products to consumers and what they, the consumers, want from the businesses. That is rather vague with simple language, so of course we could make it more sophisticated if we wanted to. We could add detail. We could make it a more academic statement, and we would add more language. For example, we could say Paco Enderhill, and he's the main person in the article who is giving us this information. Paco Underhill examines the characteristics of shopping, and we're getting this directly from the article, to understand how retailers, retailers again is using a better word than just business because we're not talking about all business here, we're talking about specifically retailers and consumers interact in the world of commerce. Both of these would be the the main idea. Basically, the article is talking about buying and selling, what businesses want, which is of course to sell, and what consumers want, which is to buy in comfort. And that is what the whole article is about. Now, as we look at this article, some of the most important things that we're concerned with for our specific essay, of course, are the characteristics of tr or traits of shopping and because of what we're going to be using for our essay. But it's important that we understand the article as a whole. And one of the things that we need to do to understand the article is to actually understand who is this man, Paco Underhill. So if we look on page 68, Malcolm Gladwell gives us this overview of Mr. Underhill and he starts with his physical characteristics and then he goes into his background and he talks about why he does what he does and why he believes what he believes. And it's very important, I think, that we understand who he is so that we can see why he does it and we have faith in him, we believe in him, we think that he knows what he's doing. This goes to credibility. The supermarkets, the consumers, the business, they go to him and they believe him. The businesses go and they listen to him. So we too should listen to him. And what Gladwell is doing here is he's building the ethos of Paco Underhill so that we too believe in him. And this is really going to matter to you when you're when you're in writing too and you're doing the, the ethos and the pathos and the logos, which is really fun. So you're being influenced by Gladwell and you don't even know it to believe in Underhill. And that's what he's doing by giving us all this information. So it's really important that we understand who Underhill is. Another thing that Gladwell goes into is he talks about typing, and typing is really interesting, oops, and actually, we'll just let that go, we don't need that, and a little scary. So let's look on page 70 in your text, and let's see page 70, oh, 70, where's my page, 70, here's page 70. And on page 70, it talks about how the supermarkets actually type us, and not just the supermarkets, but all business type us. And what this means is they figure out who we are and what we want and how we buy things so that they can then target us specifically. And I'm looking here in the middle of the page, here in the very middle, and it says, this doesn't mean that marketers and retails have stopped trying to figure out what goes on in the minds of the shoppers. One of the hottest areas in market research 
for example, is something called typing. So here's your definition right here of typing. It's a sophisticated attempt to predict the kinds of products that people will buy or the kinds of promotional pitch they will be susceptible to on the basis of where they live or how they score on a short standardized questionnaires. So just based on where you live, they can decide what you would buy. And I don't know, I think that's a little scary, but so true. And we actually do, he's talking about where you live, but all kinds of typing is happening even more not in this article. I know all of you shop online and typing is all kinds of typing happening online too. And so this is very common. We are constantly being analyzed on what we want, just where we go, what we post on Instagram, what pictures we have. Typing is a very, very normal part of our society society now. Everything that we do, people are trying to figure out what we want so they can sell to us and, and give us what we want and we'll spend our money. So this is what we're talking about on typing and it goes on to talk and he talks more about typing. So basically that's what typing is and it's a really important thing to understand. That's typing. Another thing then that's a little bit more difficult to understand but really interesting is Market Mavens. And Market Maven starts on page 70 as well. It's in the next column towards the bottom of the page and it says that Linda Price, a marketing professor, came up with the term Market Maven. And here's how it's defined as a person who has information on a lot of different products or prices or places to shop. This is a person who likes to initiate discussions with consumers and responds to requests. Market mavens like to be helpers in the marketplace. They take you shopping. They go shopping for you. And it turns out they are a lot more prevalent than you would expect. Market mavens watch more television than almost anyone else does. They read more magazines and they open their junk mail and they look closely at advertisements and they have an awful lot of influence on everyone else. According to Price, 60% of Americans claim to know a maven. So, a maven is somebody who knows what's going on. A maven is somebody who knows what's fashionable. A maven is somebody who you would go to to say, hey, what should I buy? Mavens are trendsetters. Mavens are the person that everybody wants to be, really. I am not a market maven. I have no idea what's fashionable, but some people are in fact market mavens. So on page 70 to 72, this is what's talking about the market maven. So, one of the complicated ideas, it's, it's both complicated and easy to understand, and it is the humility theory, and it's on pages 69 and 70, and again on 75. So let's look at this. After we go through all of the characteristics of shopping and all of the traits of shopping, when the stores are talking about how they market us and how they manipulate us and how they dictate to us and how we shop, at the end, there's also this idea of the humility theory. And on page 69 in the third column here, it says that Paco, Paco Underhill, is teaching his clients a kind of slavish devotion to the shopper's every whim. He is teaching them humility. And what Gladwell is saying here is that the stores are trying to be slaves in a way to what the consumer wants. They are trying to meet exactly what the consumer wants. They are trying to humble their own desires and what they want to what the consumer wants. I'm not convinced that stores actually do that, but that is in fact what Underhill tries to get people to do. Then again on page 75 in the middle column, it specifically mentions 
in the um, first middle body paragraph here, the new humility in shopping theory. And it talks about William White. And what this is talking about is actually a failure. And it's talking about when the stores put their own desires above the needs of the consumer, the stores fail. And they say that you have to put the needs of the consumer above the needs of the store. And that seems obvious to me that if the store is trying to sell something to the consumer, that the consumer should come first, but maybe it's not obvious. So basically the humility theory is that the consumer has to come first. And this is a very common theory in retail. You hear it all the time. The consumer is first, put the consumer first. The consumer is always first. But this is what it's talking about, that the retailers have to be humble. They have to put the consumer first, the needs of the consumer above the needs of the retailer. So that's basically what the humility theory is all about. So now we get to talk about the fun part of the article, the characteristics or traits of shopping. And these start on page 66 and they go all the way through the article. So let's start with the decompression zone. And the decompression zone is on page 66 and it's in the middle column. And the decompression zone, according to Paco Underhill, is a zone in which nothing sells. And he actually says, and I'm reading that never ever put anything of value in that zone, not shopping baskets or tie racks or big promotional displays because no one is going to see it. He believes that nothing sells in the decompression zone. Personally, I'm not convinced this is true because all of the stores that I go into always have things everywhere I look, but according to Underhill, stores shouldn't use things in the decompression zone. So that's basically the decompression zone. It's, it's really easy to understand. The next major idea, and this is in the same article, same column, is called the invariant right. And here I've spelled it for you, the invariant right. And he is actually has cameras and this is a very common idea and it's basically that when you walk in a store when most people walk in a store they automatically turn right and this is because most people are right-handed now not all people are right-handed mr. incredible is actually left-handed there are a lot of left-handed people but the majority of the world is right-handed so that means we automatically turn right and he actually is saying that they do that, they turn right. And that's basically just if you put things on the right side, people are gonna see it because they automatically turn right. So the more things you put on the right side, then more people will see it. It's pretty easy to understand the invariant right. These two ideas, the compression zone and invariant right, are really, really easy ideas to understand. Then the next idea that we go to is on page 67. And it is in the middle of the page on your article. Let me get my little article here, there we go. It's right here underneath the picture and it is called, it's actually, he created this theory, the butt brush theory, or there's a French word which I can't even begin to pronounce, la facture, I don't even know, however you say but in French. And what it means is that basically women are very sensitive to having their body parts touched, which is obvious. And the idea is that if the um, merchandise is close and something brushes, so for example, if I'm in a store and something brushes behind me and I, it startles me, then it will make me uncomfortable. And if I'm uncomfortable, I'm not gonna wanna shop there. Now this isn't just for women, obviously. Anyone doesn't like to be touched if they don't wanna be touched. So his idea then is the wider the aisles are, then the easier it is to shop. And so touch he's talking about. This is at the 
po top of page 67 in the bottom in the middle column it says here uh, the likelihood of a woman's being converted from a browser to a buyer is inversely proportional to the likelihood of her being brushed on her behind while she's being examined and merchandise touch or brush or bump or jostle a woman on the behind when she has stopped to look at an item and she will bolt so the idea is that we're sensitive and we don't like to be touched. We're uncomfortable. I think it's true. I don't know. If I feel crowded in a store, then I'm often uncomfortable. But again, I think that's cultural. Americans absolutely have big giant space bubbles and we like a lot more space than some other cultures. So I'm not sure how much of this is an American culture thing and how much of it is a worldwide culture thing. And Paco Underhill doesn't go into that. But that's the butt brush theory and it's on page 67. The next theory that he goes into is on page 68. And on page, page 68, he's talking specifically about petting or touching. And he also goes to um, eating a little bit, which I'm calling sampling. He doesn't actually use the term sampling. I've added that term in there. So petting is basically when we touch things, petting and touching. So if you think about it, when you're walking through the store and you reach out and you touch clothes, I don't know if you do this, but I do. I, I'm very tactile. So I walk through the store touching everything. That's just basically touching. And a lot of stores actually put the merchandise out so you can, in fact, touch it. Think about if you've ever been to a Costco or some of the stores where they have food samples as well and they let you try it, that would be sampling, kind of a try before you buy kind of thing. And that's basically what he's talking about on page 68. So you can touch it, so you can feel it, so you can sample it. Um, this is all on page 68. The next major thing that he talks about is zones and space. And then he goes into store depth. And again, this is really easy to understand. It's basically organization in that stores organize their things according to zones. And the way they organize their zones aren't necessarily what we, the consumer, might want. I don't know if you've ever been in a grocery store and you're trying to find something. For example, I can never find the powdered cheese that you put on pasta because it's never with the cheese and it's never with the pasta. I can never find it. I don't know where they file that. I always have to ask somebody because every store does it differently. So how they zone that, I completely don't know. But this is what we're talking about when they zone their things, how they organize, they create their zones. So this is zone, this is use of space. Store depth is interesting on page 68 as well because store depth has to do with how big a store is and obviously the stores want you to go into the very back of their store because if you just run into the front of their store and grab what you want then you're not going to spend as much money but if you go all the way to the back of the store you're more likely to buy more things and that leads us to the next idea which is destination items and this is on page 73 Destination items, whoops, whoops, letting that go. Whoa, okay, hang on, there we go. Destination items, let's look at page 73, which is a really, really important thing. How many of you have ever gone to Costco to buy one thing? I like the chickens at Costco, they're a great price and they're really good and they can feed Mr. Incredible and I for a week. But I go to Costco to buy one chicken and I walk out $150 later because you have to walk all the way to the very back of the store to the store depth to get the one chicken, the destination item. And on the way through, I touch and I pet and I sample and the, I don't have any butt brush problems because the aisles are so big. And so I end up with a whole bunch of things. So this is what we're talking about, destination items. Destination items are we want one thing, it's the thing that we go to for the store. And this is on page 73, um, it's in the middle of the page, 
and it says the trick and I'm reading from the article the trick there is to put destination items basic staples things that people know you have and to buy a lot of at the rear of the store again store depth so you have to walk all the way to the back of the store to get those items so very clever very clever and then we have all the way through the article we have this on page 70 and we have it on page 72 and it's really throughout and you're really going to have to read and be careful with this the different characteristics between men shopping characteristics and women shopping characteristics it's no surprise it should be no surprise to anybody that men and women shop differently of course men and women are very different and starting on page 70, it talks about specifically how men shop in grocery stores. And at the top of the page, it talks about men being more impulse driven, men don't shop with coupons. It talks a lot about men. Then it goes on to talk about the kind of environments men want, the kind of colors men want, it gives a lot of specific information about shopping for men. There's also things about women on the same page. Women want to be more hands-on, the kind of colors women want. So all of these men and women characteristics, they're all scattered. It's not all neatly put together with bullet points. You'll have to read very carefully to understand it, but it's very clear. It explains what men want and what women want and again it's pretty obvious that there would be different things on page 72 we're talking about how long men stayed in the store versus how long women stayed in the store um, we just basically going through the different kinds of things that men and women want I think that he focuses in the article a little bit more on men and he gives more details for men than he does for women, but it is all here. So these are the characteristics that he gives and they're very interesting. As we write our essay, keep in mind that you will be applying these characteristics to your stores. So again, we have your decompression zone, invariant right, butt brush theory, petting, touching, and what I'm calling sampling, which is basically eating. And then we have zones, space, and store depth, which is kind of all together, destination items, and men versus women, the characteristics of shopping in this article.